thanks everybody for coming. Um, post-lunch slot, so um, uh, we're going to try and keep you all awake. Um, uh, thanks to Cameron for inviting us all here. Um, we're going to have um, some presentations from our panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. We're gonna, they're going to talk for about 10 to 12 minutes each. We'll have a few questions for them from, from me, and then they'll give us um, some of their recommendations for um, how we can sort of um, advise our communications colleagues on um, dealing with some of these um, vaccine hesitancy issues in this post-truth world. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce the panel. Um, on my right um, is Dr. Angus Thomas, who's the, uh, Thompson, I beg your pardon, who's Head of Vaccine Confidence and Coverage at Sanofi Pasteur. On his right is Professor Tiki Pangescu um, from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. He was also at WHO for 13 years. On his right um, is Dr. Pauline Patterson, who's co-director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then finally, uh, we have Rachel Grant, who's Director of Communications and Advocacy at CEPI, the uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. So um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Angus Thompson for his uh, short presentation. Thank you. Um, so let me kick things off. I wanted to just spend one minute on the title of our, our session today. So, I mean, time asked the question uh, last year, and... Uh, Post-truth was word of the year last year by one of the dictionaries. Um, the definition of this adjective was relating to a situation in which people are more likely to accept an argument based on their emotions, beliefs, uh, values, rather than one based on facts. But in fact, the comedian Stephen Colbert, um, in almost, uh, what, 10, 12 years ago, coined the, fray, the, the term truthiness, which actually I like even better in terms of how do we understand this challenge, um, he called it the truth that comes from the gut, not the facts, or the truth that we want to exist. And I think, I think you know, in this era, in the last uh, 18 months, um, two years, we're really starting to see this in all walks of, of life, of polit political life and so on. And so the question we're asking today is, what impact will this have, could this have on vaccination programs? From truth to trust. So trust... All vaccination programs are built on trust. Research shows that it's all about trust in the vaccines, but also in the governments and the health authorities that provide those vaccines. It's about trust in the producers of vaccines. It's a general feeling of trust. And what we know is that trust is down. So there's, a, there's an annual barometer run by Edelman on trust, and trust levels are probably at an all-time low. When we look at this aggregate score of trust in four different institutions, um, the government, media, industry, and uh, NGOs, the, pri the, public, um, the civil sector, uh, trust is down. There are less and less countries, or more and more countries, that are in that green circle there, which is classified as general distrust in, that, in those institutions. And the last point that I want to leave you with is, despite this, we know that consistently across the world, in almost every study that's done, People trust their healthcare professionals. They trust them a lot. They trust them about vaccines. Um, <clears throat> that barometer dug in, and in fact, you know, it's not all grim. The calculus of trust may be changing, but uh, there's positive news as well. So trust in traditional media actually has risen in the last 12 months, and trust in social media has gone down. That's trust in these sources for general news and information. And, and we have data from 20 country, uh, multi-country study in 20 countries across uh, the Americas, Asia, and, and Europe, that supports this idea that specifically for vaccines, um, uh, social media is really the least trusted of all sources, the healthcare professional being the top. Now, uh, fake news is essentially, um, I mean, what we're looking at today is the impact of misinformation um, on vaccination, on perception of vaccination, and fake news is really calculated, targeted, calibrated misinformation. And so I wanted to just give us a, a quick idea of what, does, what the data tells us about fake news. Um, in one study done over the US election, it was actually only a very small fraction of people's news diets, less than, less than 6%. In a second study that looked over 10 years at uh, something in the order of 100,000 rumours on everything, 
uh, propagated by over 3 million people. Not surprisingly, we found that uh, lies spread faster and wider than the truth. But an interesting other study that was done here in the UK in about 4,000 people uh, suggests that uh, kind of counterintuitively, people are not necessarily locked in echo chambers. More than 90% of people actually have a fairly broad news diet and they're not locked in those echo chambers. So my point here is just to, to be sure that as we look at this problem, we continuously challenge ourselves with data. This is what the data tells us. What the data doesn't tell us is does fake news change people's attitudes and behaviours? And that's an open question today. I want to give three quick examples of how the spread of misinformation, um, the loss of trust, can lead to outbreaks of disease. <clears throat> so the classic here, we're, at the home, we're in, the, in the home here in the UK of the MMR scandal. started in 1998. Andrew Wakefield uh, made a spurious connection between autism and MMR, the MMR vaccine. This led to a decrease in the green line of uh, coverage rates for MMR, which led to measles cases. An important point here, this, this, this follows a pretty common trajectory. We had a loss of trust before this happened. We had sca the, the BSE scandal in the, U in the UK. People had already lost a level of trust in the health authorities. The next example, oh, when I look at this, it's actually far too busy. It looked better on my computer screen. This is what's been happening this year in Brazil. So um, in 2016, the yellow fever virus broke out of its sylvatic cycle in the Amazon uh, basin and started moving south. Um, it slowed in 2017 through the winter season, but at the end of last year, early this year, it reappeared and it started heading very rapidly south towards some of the very large population, coastal population centres like Rio and Sao Paulo. The Ministry of Health implemented a mass vaccination campaign. Their target was to vaccinate 23 million people. They did a lot of things right. They had community outreach, social media outreach in terms of how they communicated around the campaign. And at the beginning, demand was really high. In fact, there was a gang leader in one of the favelas who kidnapped the vaccinators to get them to vaccinate his whole favela. And one of the vaccinators said, people have a lot of excuses, but when we show, them, when we show up, it's usually easy, easy to convince them. However, not long after, it seems, and this is hard to know, it seems that some rumours, um, some misinformation started circulating, circulating on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is an extremely important application for Brazilians, uh, over half of the population is on there, and a lot of them use it. For a lot of them, it's their primary news source. Now, it's hard to know about these rumours because WhatsApp is an encrypted closed circuit, but the things that were being circulated there potentially had far more resonance than the things we, see, we might see in open channels because they're being communicated to us from the people we know, from the people we trust. There was information, and there was, there was stuff on the vaccine being dangerous, fatal reactions, etc., this then progressed. There were audio recordings at the beginning. There were videos that popped out of WhatsApp and started to appear on YouTube and Facebook. And these were really professionally produced videos. Expert testimonials, personal experiences, talking about government theories. And they got a lot of traction. At the same time, the government and some of the public health institutes started doing the right thing. They started communicating in those social media channels as well. But quite simply, we had millions of hits on some of the videos. Um, coming out of these, this misinformation and, you know, tens of thousands of hits on the ones from the experts, from the authorities. And an important event that I just want us to bear in mind around March was when, to manage uh, shortages of vaccine, the Ministry of Health told everyone that they were using a fractionated dose. The Ministry of Health said, we're using fractionated doses. The public heard, weak vaccine. This is an illustration of how misinformation travels through social, through social media channels. Um, but the question really is, how and when does it get traction in people's minds? My last example, I'll move fairly quickly through this one. I'm sure many of you heard about this. Um, in, in, at the start of the, the um, Global Polio Eradication Initiative in 1988, there were 350,000 cases plus probably a lot more in the world of polio. By 2001, this extraordinary human endeavour had reduced the cases, the global cases of polio, incidence of polio to less than 500. And in 2003, a religious body in northern Nigeria called for a boycott of the campaign. They said that it was a Western plot to sterilise uh, Muslims or to infect them with HIV. And this happened, this had a dramatic impact on coverage rates and a dramatic, we saw, we saw again rumours leading 
to um, outbreaks of disease. 30% increase in polio. Polio spread out of Nigeria to over 15 countries. And this set back that initiative dramatically. What's important is that before this happened, there were a number of factors that had probably already impacted the levels of trust in the population, unethical drug testing by pharmaceutical companies, a, a very, very deep mistrust of the southern West government and of the West. So the misinformation that was there floating around way back before, this wasn't new, somehow got traction here. And by getting traction, it led to a decrease. It literally led to disease outbreaks. The virus followed the rumours. So what do these three cases illustrate for us? First of all, I think these viruses, these pathogens, have been passengers on our human journey for millennia. Okay? Egyptians got polio. And they're, they've just been waiting for any break, any decrease in any gap in vaccination. When that gap appears, they jump in. So misinformation can cause disease outbreaks. They also illustrate this initial idea that I gave you that the foundation of vaccination is trust. And I think in particular the middle one shows how these seeds of misinformation can bounce around on the winds of social media. But it really takes um, minds that have been fertilised by mistrust for them to take seed, for them to get traction. And finally, I think that they illustrate how inherently fragile vaccination programs are. This problem's never going away. It's always been here and it's always going to be here. Vaccination is an act that's implemented by governments. Uh, it affects all citizens. It affects young citizens. It affects them when they're healthy. It's done to prevent them from diseases that are less and less visible. So vaccination programs are inherently vulnerable to manipulation for political, financial, uh, and in, uh, a very deep inquiry by Brian Deere from the Sunday Times showed that Andrew Wakefield had rather substantial financial interests in, in the rumours that he set underway, or other reasons. And so I think, to finish, we need to understand this problem through an epidemiological approach, the way that we understand diseases, the viruses themselves, through epidemiology. We're currently trying to understand how the keystone virus jumped out and into the human population. We also need to understand through the same general approaches how these rumours, how misinformation somehow gets traction in people's minds, somehow is able to change people's behaviours to lead to gaps in under vaccination, to lead to outbreaks. What are the environmental, what are the psychological conditions that pre prelude this? So, in a, world, in a world where uh, vaccines are saving five lives a minute, there are over six million people walking and dancing today because they didn't get polio because they were vaccinated. We need to start by really understanding what are the motivations of those who get vaccinated, what is driving people's decision to get vaccinated. But I think it's also important that we start trying to understand what are the motivations of those authors of the misinformation that is potentially having an impact on our vaccination programs. Thank you.